The estimated cost to repair the damaged KZN roads currently sits at, listen to this, 5.6 billion rand. And this number was revealed by KZN Premier Sihle Zikalala during an update briefing on the floods. So, so we're asking how exactly will the process of rebuilding and repairing these roads actually unfold? We're joined by Professor Richard Walls from the Civil Engineering Department at Stellenbosch University. He joins us uh, on our telephone lines this morning, Prof, because you are being load shed at the moment as we ramp up to stage four as of early this morning. But thanks very much indeed for joining us. I mean, this, the, the, the Premier in that address saying that most provincial roads are unsafe for use for now. In your mind, you know, the extent of the damage, what does that exactly mean? Um, good morning. Good morning to listeners. And yes, I hope I managed to make it to the end of the, the uh, conversation before our cell phone towers give out. Um, there are a lot of things that are going to need to be done. And firstly, in terms of the statement that the, the national roads being unsafe, there could be many different reasons from that. I mean, it ranges from obviously the spectacular entire um, sections of roads being washed away and bridges being damaged mm. right through to potholes. And then perhaps in some areas, it's just debris strewn across the road that you can't use it because it's blocked. So a detailed assessment needs to be done. And then following that, bit by bit, there's going to have to, I mean, I know the, the cleanup is already underway with military and various other people involved, but it's <clears throat> open the roads that where it's just things that have been blocked, but then also to get engineers out as fast as possible, as widely as possible to do assessment. But the uh, assessing a road or fixing a bridge or you know, replacing a, a culvert section that's washed away, none of that's rocket science in itself. We easily have the engineers and the contractors to be able to do it. The, the problem is just the magnitude of this and the speed at which it needs to be done makes an extremely difficult process. Mm. L let me ask you this, Prof. I, I mean, if the job was done right... Um, would we ex expect this kind of damage, the extent of the damage that we've seen in KwaZulu-Natal? Is there something that yeah. may have gone wrong initially, dating back decades, that has led to the extent of the damage that we've seen now? It's, it's possible. I think we have to be careful because there's a number of things that can come together in these sorts of, of incidents. And we have to have a look at it. I, I haven't seen the data yet. Mm -hmm. First thing we need to see... Um, for each of these cases, well, what were, what was the different infrastructure designed for? Normally you have a bridge or a culvert under a road, um, stormwater infrastructure. It is designed for specific flow rates. So that's a specific um, cubic meters per second of mm. water to pass through it. And the question is, firstly, was that design sufficient? And that could have been sufficient at the time, but may have changed. Now, for instance, you designed it assuming that upstream of you was primarily um, fields and farmland, etc. Now, time has gone by, and instead you have 50,000 homes, paved areas, shopping centers. When the rain falls, mm. it all washes um, off very quickly, goes into the stormwater system, and you have a very high flood peak. Instead of um, a small amount of running off, you've got large amount running off very fast. Yeah. So yeah. It, it could have been changes in areas which have le has led to infrastructure being undersized. I mean, if we, it's, uh, Oh, yeah. no, please, please go ahead, and I'll ask the question after. Well, yeah. yeah. No, no problem. Yeah, so there are a couple of things. Firstly, then it's that. Then it's also, I mean, has it been maintained? So perhaps things have gotten blocked. So perhaps then it just hasn't been maintained to the point that then things washed away. It is possible that climate change is influencing it. And then also, we, we only design infrastructure for certain sort of size storms, a 1 in 50 year storm, 1 in 100 year storm. We've got to see the data now. Is it in excess of what we design for? Yeah. I mean, maybe it is just an abnormally big event. And then also, climate change could be influencing it. So we are seeing those, ab those abnormally big events more normally. Yeah, yeah. You know, the follow-up question I wanted to ask you is, if indeed it, it, it is a case in some situations where, as you say, there was farmland up ahead from, from a major road and then now is a housing de development, let's say, and it's a lot more traffic, there are a lot more vehicles passing, should steps not be taken if I'm changing one area from farmland to a housing development to then support the surrounding infrastructure? There are ways, and in the, the modern building codes, there are actually steps that you should design. So when you put a 
big infrastructure development, you actually should have stormwater attenuation. So what happens is, rather than it all suddenly running off into the rivers or stormwater, it actually runs into a sort of a, a dam-ish area that fills up and then slowly empties. Mm. So there are ways and means of doing that that are on the coast. Now, many of those, um, some of those interest developments may not have it, and also some of them may have been built before that was done. So it depends on when was the infrastructure built and when was the in, um, development built. It is also possible those haven't been maintained or built right. So there, there is, we have to have a look on a case-by-case basis to see why did each of these sections fail, what led mm. to it, what is upstream, um, is it sufficient, um, was it designed correctly or was it maintained correctly? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the visuals on the screen this morning, Prof, are show, uh, showing just the extent of the damage to some of the roads in KZN. Uh, there's also visuals of uh, bridges having collapsed. There it is on the screen now. Uh, and the question now, as government comes to grips with rebuilding the homes of people who have lost their homes as a result of this kind of damage, the question now, according to government, is that we need to wait for the land to be stable, for the land to stabilize. What does that mean? We, once again, we have to look at each individual case. Now, for instance, where you've had a road that's washed away, um, it normally would have washed away, for instance, if it's next to a river. That river may have then um, either burst its banks or undercut. Perhaps there was some sort of stabilization that has been washed away, rock baskets, etc. So now it is possible that you have a, a section of road missing, but maybe even the area around that is not stable. So you have to get right down to possibly river level, depending on, on the situation, and then build up from there. So you may have the, the soil failing now. Um, if another storm comes down, maybe more will wash away. So there's quite a lot of construction works, bulk earthworks, civil works that needs to be done to your technical engineers involved to start stabilizing these slopes. And there's various ways, depending on the geometry, as I said, rock baskets, um, even sometimes just simple bags for now, just as interim stability. Mm. Um, I mean, then there's also various more advanced systems with rock anchors and all sorts yeah, of things, yeah. but hopefully just most of the simple time. Look, I know that you, you would prefer to um, see circumstances, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, specific instances of where uh, the land is given way under, uh, let's say, a development of flats, for example. But our, our viewers will, will uh, be familiar with the visuals I'm talking about. Uh, flats that are built on a slope by the beachfront where one side of the land has completely, completely given way. Prof, the, the question I have insofar as something like that is concerned is, you know, when you're building a development of that nature, on the beachfront, the, la the land is sloping upwards uh, and you're building a whole block of, uh, of flats there. I is that something that's predictable when building is beginning? Um, slip slope failures or sort of a landslide type failure is predictable. We do have, I mean, equations and things that can be used to predict when it will happen. So it's not something that we, we don't know about. I mean, it's been something that's been studying. I mean, civil engineers, Students do that in third year or fourth year at, at university. Uh, it would just be, do, has it been done? Um, and then also, has something changed on, on the land? Um, were the, the, was there a proper soil investigation mm. and various other factors? So, yes, we should know it can happen. But also, what did the, for instance, water infrastructure fail or uh, drainage systems fail? We, um, the engineers, let's say, designed assuming that the, the water... The, the area wasn't totally waterlogged, and now the systems got blocked, everything mm. got absolutely swamped, and then the soil loses its strength, and then there's a lot of pressure from the back of water on retaining walls. Retaining wall fails, there you go. So it's possible that also the scenario that happened wasn't what was designed for. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe that was an oversight on the engineer side, maybe it just the water infrastructure failed leading to it. Yeah, so a whole range of different factors that may have contributed to various incidents happening. Uh, from what you can tell, just from watching the extent of the damage insofar as, for example, our coverage here on Channel 405 is concerned, Prof, how big of a job is faced by the KwaZulu-Natal government now? Oof, this is, this is going to be a tough one. Um, this is going to be weeks of cleaning, months of small repairs, and then many months. I wouldn't surprise me a year from now we are still seeing especially um, bridge infrastructure and the likes being repaired. 
but it's just the scope of it. As I mentioned earlier, fixing a bridge, a road, a pothole is, is very doable. Mm. But fixing five billion rands worth in a short period of time is, is the challenge. Also, it's, it's not just even the engineering capacity and the contractor's capacity, it's the management capacity to compile um, the specifications for engineers to then divide up the work, for them to assess it, to put together then designs, to tender those designs and get contractors on site. And um, also to do that without money going missing and not being allocated to the wrong sort of contractors and groups and engineers, etc. And then in-house capacity at government to manage all of that, to oversee the work and to make sure that what we're getting is quality. Otherwise, the same thing's going to happen again, be it five years or 20 mm. years or 50 years from now. Yeah, certainly. Corruption, we would not want it to impede what is already a massive job ahead there for the KZN government. Professor Richard Walls, let me thank you for your time this morning. Some interesting insight on uh, just exactly what is ahead in the weeks and months to come with the Department of Civil Engineering at Stellenbosch University.